authenticity and what it's like being authentic. It's it's like the no Nike Swish logo. You start off being a completely authentic person because you're a child and you don't know any better. But then somewhere down the line, you got beaten into line and you're you're this compliant person that has basically no personality or individual thought of your own. So that's the the, the trough. And then as you get mature in your life, you realize that being your authentic self is your best self. Culture is different to race. Race you can't choose, but culture is one where you can choose. You can choose to live in a culture that suits your values, that allows you to thrive. One of those assumptions, that cultural assumptions that we had as Asian Australians is that if, if you put your head down, bums up, you, you work hard, you'll get recognized. You know? and, and that's a, a value of hard work that's instilled in us. Nothing wrong with that, but it's also missing another element of understanding the importance of being visible and having a personal brand. How will that make people more successful, more fulfilled in modern Australian workplace? Okay, so rather than pursuing power status position, right, you pursue... That's what ultimately brings fulfillment, is what's going to be the difference between a satisfying career versus a job that you hate. Welcome to another episode of Success with Purpose, where we help mentor you into becoming a more successful version of yourself. We do this through giving you access to mentors you typically would never have the opportunity to connect with. We explore their journeys, their experiences, their life-changing events, their fields of expertise, and most importantly, their purpose. My name is Harry Goldberg, husband to an incredible woman, father of two amazing daughters, host interviewer and interrogator of this podcast and director and advisor and meditation teacher of Purpose Advisory. This purpose-driven project is entirely funded by Purpose Advisory, which I am a director of. We guide clients to make great life and money decisions, and we do this through a range of different services. Life vision experiences, personality, investment strategies, cash flow systems, and through teaching meditation. If you want to learn any more about any of these, link in the comments below. Now, just before we learn from yet another exceptional guest, if you find value from these conversations, please make sure to like and subscribe below, leave a review. It really does make a difference. And of course, share with someone else who's going to find value. Now, listen in, pay attention, take some notes, enjoy. Let's begin. Jeffrey Wang, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, Harry. All right. So the, the brief synopsis for you is cybersecurity expert, founder of Professional Development Forum, and co-host of 10 Lessons to Taking, which took 50 years to learn, which is a mm -hmm. podcast. So I'll encourage people to listen to that as well. But before, before we dive into your entire journey and who you are, where you are, how you got to where you are as well, how do you define success? Oh, thanks. Oh, jumping straight into the deep end. I see. Uh... Diving straight into it. Look, uh, success for me has evolved quite a bit over time. As I define it, you know, when I was young, I've always defined it pretty much the same way as everything else, you know, fame, fortune, power, prestige, all that sort of stuff. Um, for me, um, success is all about meaning. You know, it's about the, the positive wake that you, you leave behind. I think ultimately um, I want to leave the world better uh, in a better state than when I found it. And I like to start with the people around me. Um, and realizing that if I could have that positive impact in my immediate life, even if it's just one person, that is success for me. What does, what does positive impact mean? Like what, mm -hmm. what would it look like to have positive impact and what does enough positive impact look like? <laughs> yeah. So I, I love how you just really, um, delving deep into it. So for me, it, it's about uh, more than just, you know, uh, the Epicurean worldview, which is, you know, pain minimization and pleasure maximization, right? I think um, it, it, it's more about finding that fulfillment in life um, and, and also doing so for others. So, you know, when, when I came to that realization that i had been pursuing all the wrong things, it, it completely changed my worldview, it completely changed my outlook. And, and um, in, interestingly, it completely changed um, how much I suffered as a result of that, you know, pursuing happiness, pursuing, um, you know, money or fame or power or any of the conventional stuff has actually led to very much an empty existence, even, even when I was seemingly successful at it. Um, it's only when I realized that what I needed to do was, and what, what ultimately fulfills me is seeking um, 
that meaning. And, and what I mean by that, you know, in, in a, I suppose in a, in a more basic sense is knowing that I'm, you know, making other people's lives better. And part of that is allowing them to understand, um, the, you know, going, helping them to come to the same realization I did around what life is all about. Okay. So you've, you've, it sounds like in your journey, at some point you, you found like your definition of success has evolved and it went from kind of like the money and the power and the fortune, the prestige and started going to how you can, how you can feel more fulfilled. Mm. And then your purpose or your, your more expanded definition of success, success now has evolved into helping other people experience the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Look, helping other people uh, achieve that journey. Look, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, um, you know, the tr the conventional measures of success is, you know, is not something to be pursued. I mean, you still need your financial security and everything else. You know, it, it's more the, it's more like a hygiene factor. The absence of which, you know, will probably cause a bit of suffering. However, um, I think if you, if, if that's your sole focus, then ultimately you're going to live a very empty existence. Um, and you know, as much as some people could do, could live with that, um, I know I certainly isn't programmed that way. And it took a, a while for me to come to that realization. Um, so it, it's, you know, sometimes you just got to look within to understand what really makes you tick. And, you know, it, it's only when I step back and reflect, you know, um, it, why do I still feel so, um, meaning why am i still feeling so down even though it seem you know i seem to have all the things that i i think i wanted um and that's that point when i realize well what about you know uh well i started asking the real question right uh and in fact the the, the question that led to my realization was one where i asked my closest friends what was i doing when you see me at my best and surprisingly one of my friends came back and said, when you're helping others, that was my aha moment going, yes, you're right. For, for some reasons, you know, I don't mind taking time out of my day to help others because ultimately that's what gives my life a sense of fulfillment. Um, and that realization changed everything about who I was as a person. Um, and you know, for me that, that, um, that realization made me realize uh, a true nature of how I was programmed, how I'm wired. You know, this is, this is my DNA and my belief since then is that that's pretty much the, the reality. Um, and, and I believe that somewhat, if not almost universal, you know, it's universal. Okay. Let's, and thank you for sharing all of that. This is, this is pretty cool. You've basically shared that your definition of success is more than what you were brought up to believe. It started changing and it started focusing more on how you're able to help others or being able to serve others. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you're doing when you're best. Like, so you kind of realize money's not success. Enjoying life is success. Helping other people enjoy life is more success. And now you're doing a whole range of things. Some of those are helping others and some of those are more for um, kind of, I think you were talking about the hygiene factors, right? Like make sure you've got enough finances and you're, and you're okay. Um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe let's start more or less at the beginning. Let's explore your journey. And you can start wherever you want. I had one guest start back in the 1600s when his, when his ancestors arrived in New York on the Mayweather, but most people kind of start around childhood. What was, <laughs> what was it, what was it like for you? What was your upbringing and what kind of uh, baggage and history and gifts did you carry from there? Uh, like from, like just from the starting point. Sure. Thank, thank, thanks for that. I, and I, I don't know if I could actually go back to 1600s because quite frankly, I don't know my family history that well. Um, but uh, so look, I was born in Taiwan, um, which is a, uh, you know, so island off the, the coast of China. And um, it was a military dictatorship when where we are growing up. But I suppose as a result of that, um, you know, I was ever more um, uh, sort of aware of the, the, I suppose the importance of freedom and, 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 you know, free, free expression. Now, um, as with many in, in our generation, um, uh, our parents sought for a better life. And, and at the time, um, it was a Tiananmen square, um, incident in, in China. And we thought that that was going to lead to some unrest, uh, in China and in the region. So we, we did what we could and just literally got, got the hell out. Um, we ended up in the only place we could probably get to at the time, which is New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and hence my childhood. So, uh, big, massive cultural shock. Um, now not realizing that, um, the, you know, obviously as a 10 year old kid, you don't really realize, uh, 
you know, a thing called, you know, sort of cultural competency or, or the ability to code switch, as I like to call it today. Um, and and for my formative years, I think it was a massive shock to me personally, a bit of a bit of self confidence, my my view of myself. Uh, I was very unsure of who I was because it feels like you know whatever I step on, um, it was just a bit of a you know a cultural faux pas ready to happen. But so I did the the best thing I could of just trying to fit in. Now you probably noticed that I've got a pretty Aussie accent. Um, but what you probably don't know is that I've only arrived in Australia since I was 17. And that's because of a skill that I learned as a 10 year old trying to fit in. You know, I've learned my best to disappear into the background. And the best way to do that is to not have anything that differentiates me from anybody else. And hence my ability to speak with an accent that um, fits in with the rest of the group. So um, with that sort of mindset, I, you know, pretty much had a very uneventful, very un. Um, it was almost invisible for me. You know, my, my goal in life was just to be invisible and just to fit in. Uh, and at the same time, um, I had the cultural programmings of an Asian kid, which is to be, you know, they, they tell you stuff that you just believe at that age. You know, they tell you that you're good at maths, <laughs> you're good at science. And, uh, you know, don't bother with English because that's just not your thing and you'll never be any good at it. So I just, you know, didn't really put in much effort on there. Um, it's amazing how much later on I regretted that decision because of how much I enjoyed these uh, creative endeavors. Um, but as a kid, you know, this is your typical, you know, if you can't color in <laughs> color inside the lines and you're probably not going to be an artist, but as you know, you know, Vincent van Gogh probably wasn't one of those kids that know how to color in <laughs> between the lines. So, um, yeah, I, I say that just to give you a context of the kind of personality I was. So, you know, you would probably, you know, in the Western culture, you probably define that as pretty unimpressive, but there's a reason for that, you know, and, and it's just, um, again, you know, the, the mindset for me was pain minimization. You know, I just did not want to be exposed, embarrassed or, 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 or be caught sort of uh, outside of my comfort zone, really. And unfortunately, that mindset carried through all the way through to university. Um, and, um, for university, my parents decided that I, I need, um, you know, that we should probably move to Australia because of better jo uh, job and career prospects, which I insight was probably the best move. Um, and I ended up in an Australian university, um, and, you know, because of my cultural programmings, I, I ended up doing actuarial, actuarial studies, which is again, a whole, whole, <laughs> a whole lot of maths. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's not my, stepping outside the stereotype, is it? No, not at all. And unfortunately, you know, my, my, it, my, my life isn't all that really, uh, yeah. Out, when you say, you know, it was, I was, I walking stereotype. Yes, I was, you know, a nerdy kid that's good at maths and, you know, I did, I did what I was told. Um, but I realized that it wasn't leading to my fulfillment. It's unsurprising that when my heart's not in it, eventually I gave up on that. Um, so three and a half years into the course, despite, you know, sort of very close to getting that, um, that degree, I decided I was just going to switch, you know, switch lanes and, uh, end up with a computer science degree. Um, and all the meanwhile, I was getting distracted because at university, I found, I discovered student politics and, um, you know, and, and I think in hindsight, I realized that that was my passion all along. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I'd love, you know, I, I, you know, we love freedom. We, we, we're acutely aware of the importance of a lot of these things having grown up in Taiwan. Um, and so, you know, so every spare time I get, you know, I get involved in these sort of activities and, and unsurprisingly, you know, it wasn't very hard to, um, to, uh, be passionate about, you know, to do well, something that you're passionate about. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that, that mindset didn't carry through to my career. So even though I was elected the. Uh, chair of the students council back at Macquarie University. This is back in my university days. You know, I never saw that as a, a valid career path. <laughs> why, why not? Uh, look, again, you know, it's cultural programmings, a uh, bit of as a negative self-talk. And uh, truth be told, I, I was very, um, I wasn't a very confident kid, right? Um, this is with the underpinnings, you know, if you believe in the Freudian theories, you know, of what happened to me as a child, you know, I've been sort of plucked out of one environment and, and stuck into another. And at the time, you know, with, as with many other Asian kids, you know, this is the, the early nineties or, or, or late eighties, right. Um, our culture was not seen as a positive back then. And, and, 
you know, that's partly our own fault. You know, we never, we're never told to have pride or, or to understand the, the value of our culture. And, and a lot of this will, I learned later on in life, you know, the value of the, the Asian values that, that was instilled to me. And they, you know, there are positives with the Asian culture that are probably a cherished today that I just, you know, didn't back then. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to fit in. So as a result of that, I, um, didn't push a lot of these boundaries. You know, I looked at myself, I said, well, you know, that, that could never happen for me. So why, why bother trying similar to why I didn't really work on my English assignments or put in as much effort in my English assignments and, you know, life takes you to, unfortunately, when you're not in charge of your life, what happens is that you, you go to the past of these resistance. So I ended up um, graduating with a computer science degree and, um, Ended up at, um, at you know in in a big major telco in Australia and and just working you know in in that sort of environment. So um, continuing on, my career was you know in in again it's all about perspectives, right? So um, I if I was to reflect, I was ex in, extremely fortunate. Like be, being able to live in Australia in itself is a privilege. You know we, we're already you know top 1% just by virtue of being in the country. But, um, at, you know, at the time, um, you know, we worked our way and I just felt like everybody else was promoted ahead of me and, uh, got extremely frustrated. So in 2007, this is the, um, uh, the professional development forum was formed and it, in, in truth, that was formed out of um, frustration in our careers. So many of my peers and I got together, you know, a lot of them from the, an Asian Australian cultural background. And we looked at our careers and we felt like we just weren't going anywhere. We're treading water, we're trying hard. Um, and we couldn't, you know, we couldn't understand why, or we, we were just very unfulfilled. And so, so we got so together. This is just, to, just to clarify, this is because, so because of your upbringing or what you're talking about, the, the wiring and the conditioning as a result of your upbringing and what your parents taught you ultimately, culturally, mm -hmm. uh, and then the level of, comp which led to the level of confidence you had. Uh, you were getting frustrated that you were just getting overtaken by others, primarily by Caucasian Australians uh, in Korea. And you're like, this is just frustrating. We're not, we're not getting ahead. And you noticed a lot of your, a lot of other Asian Australians were having the same frustration. Yeah. So, so thanks for that clarification. Yeah. So, so yes, so it's, it's a bit of both. There's a bit of nuance to all of this. So part of it is um, our definition of success. So, so as you, as you probably um, uh, alluded to before, and the part of it was around what, what we call cultural competencies, right? So the, um, uh, the reason that professional reform was important in my own career is, is that it actually gave me clarity as to what the actual problem statement was. So a lot of us weren't getting the kind of acknowledgement because we're invisible in our organizations. And, and a lot of this was through the cultural programmings, you know, so, um, and what I mean by that, it, look, this is a little bit difficult to explain, um, unless you've experienced living in a different culture. Um, so, uh, for for people who's lived uh, and worked internationally, they'll know exactly what I mean, um, especially if they operate in a culture that's very much diametrically opposed to the one that they're, they're, um, they're growing up in. Now, for people who hasn't, um, the, the best way I could describe that experience is like, you know, you have to try and tell someone that they live in the matrix because everything you know to be true is in, you know, <laughs> is, is within the rules, you know, so how do you know it's air that you're breathing when you don't, right? If you, if you grew up in the matrix, it's only until you've been plucked out of the matrix that you realize that, you know, what you hold to be ironclad truth is just not the case. Now for us, um, part of it is that we've been plucked out of the matrix. And part of it is because we're not even aware that we've been plucked out of the matrix. And you try to, you try to survive in the real world, the same way you survive in the matrix, you're not going to do very well. And so, um, one of those assumptions that cultural assumptions that we had as, as, um, as Asian Australians is that if, if you put your head down, bums up, you, you work hard, you'll get recognized, you know, and, and that's a, a value of hard work that's instilled in us. You know, I, nothing wrong with that, but it's also missing another element of understanding the importance of being visible and you know having a personal brand and so in fact I, I still remember the very first lesson that we learned from the professional development forum and it was a very, it was probably at the time the most successful asian australian executive that we knew and she told us a story about how she experienced exactly the same thing everybody promoted ahead of her 
people who were less capable, people who were less um, uh, hardworking were, were promoted ahead. But there was one point she came to the realization. So she said, what you've got to do is you've got to go and do a good job and you will tell every person who will listen that you've gone and done a good job. And that's when the penny dropped for me. You know, it's the second part that we don't do because we were told as kids that if you were to do that, you're, you know, you're not humble. You know, you're not acting like a, a person of virtue in our culture because you're blowing your own horns. And so in order to be successful in Australia, we, we almost have to deprogram ourselves from the cultural assumptions that we were brought up with. Um, and so that was a very interesting revelation. But now knowing that to, to actually walking it is a, it, it's, it's a hell of a lot harder than you realize. I was, I was just, so I'm in Singapore at the moment on extended family holiday, living with my, uh, living uh, with my wife's in-laws. Um, we're so over in Singapore, my wife's Singaporean Chinese. We, yeah, there's, there's definitely that, that culture shock. I'm, I'm not so surprised by it anymore, but say 10, 13 years ago, I, I certainly was, it was, it was very, very strange for me. Um, and I've seen it in a lot of her friends, a lot of her network. Um, but then even just, uh, just a week ago, um, oh, sorry, basically I'm, I'm very, I'm very social, as you can probably tell, um, I head to the playground and I'm chatting with whoever said so my, my daughter, who's three and a half years old, she can be very social as well when she feels comfortable with where she is and she can be very confident and I'm very much the type of parent that kind of just lets her uh, run wild, try something. If she climbs up somewhere, she knows she needs to be able to climb her way back down afterwards. Like she's not going to climb up somewhere and go, yeah, I'm scared. It's like, no, you've <laughs> got to be confident in what you're doing. So if you're going to climb up something, go for it. Climb up, awesome. Just know that you're also going to try and climb down. If you really need me, I'll help you. But otherwise, you do it, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, she's really confident climbing up really high to different places because she's also got a plan to come down. It gives her even more confidence. She's very social. She'll she'll be with most Australian kids. She's not going to be that bossy, right? Compar comparatively, like the kids will usually assert themselves. Here, she'll kind of like, not not intentionally wanting to boss the other kids around, but she'll just assert herself and the other kids will kind of just follow along. Yeah. And one of the dads came and I was just having a chat with him. He's like, wow, like what she's she's different to other kids. <laughs> like she's she's so confident. She 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 seems to really be able to express herself really well in what she wants. And the other kids are kind of just following it. Like what's like what have you done differently and what type of schooling and that kind of stuff, right? Start that conversation. And then when I shared that I was thinking about homeschooling and not even sending her to main school and how I was considering a preschool for a couple of days while in Singapore, but chose against it mainly for the reason that they make all kids wear uniforms here at like preschool at childcare. Why are you making kids wear uniform at childcare? <laughs> and he said something very aligned with what you're just sharing. And he mm -hmm. says, that, well, in, in our Asian culture, it's, it's Singaporean Chinese, but it's talking Asian in general, mm -hmm. Southeast Asian. Uh, it's like, as soon as you, like, if you're, if you're doing something with your kid, that's different to all the others, or you're not doing something the same, that's for all the others, then you're worried your kid's going to miss out and then they're not going to fit in and then they're going to fail. That's right. So you kind of just, so the whole culture ends up all the parents pretty much do all the same things for all their kids. That's and right. Try to uniform them. And he, mm -hmm. it, it's crazy though. Like he, I guess is is probably the first Singaporean generation that's been very open to the West, mm -hmm. you know, like his late thirties, early forties, and his, um, he's got young kids. And so it's, it's different, right? There's a cultural mm -hmm. shift, which is happening. I see more dads being involved with kids now yeah. and like all those types of things, which is different to even 10 years ago. Right. Mm. Um, well, it's quite impressive. I mean, that, that having to have that level of awareness, I mean, Singapore it is a very cosmopolitan place because I, I guess, you know, so if you're going to find that level of awareness, on the uh, on on I suppose the cultural competencies it's, it's it's in Singapore right because that's where East and West kind of meet, um, but you're absolutely on the ball there in terms of that that mindset and you know even though I left Taiwan when I was ten it's incredible how much of that mindset stays with you, you know even through those formative years, um, you know I've got a son who's thirteen now and and I just 
realize, wow, like, you know, the, you know, uh, all the stuff that you spoke, you speak about, you know, that's probably said in his personality and, you know, knowing what I know now, the way I would go about raising, uh, I go about raising my son is very, very different to the way I was raised, you know, and the focus that I was now, I completely understand what my parents were trying to do for me, you know, raising me in the way that I conform to the expectations of those around me, because if I didn't, you know, I probably wouldn't fare very well. And in reality, you know, that that's probably true too of the Western world. However, the rules are just different, you know. So in the Western world, if you don't have that ability to be sociable, you know, if you don't have the ability to take charge, then I suppose you're not leadership material. Whereas in the East, it's, it's a very different set of values and orders. And I would even argue that uh, the leadership qualities that makes you a good leader in the West is, um, and, and the leadership quality that makes you a good leader in the East are somewhat uh, mutually exclusive. Um, not everything, but there are, there are qualities that, you know, if, if you're a good leader in the West, you're probably going to fail in the culture in, in the East. And, and unless you can adjust your style as you go, it would be very difficult for you to to be successful doing exactly the same thing, and and I guess that's that's what we call cultural competency. How how much of that is because of the the government regimes, as mm -hmm. opposed, and like the that type of culture versus just the culture of like Asian culture. Look, I mean, the, the government regimes are a reflection of the culture of the day, right? Um, and and the, the culture of the population, because that's sort of the way that people relate to each other. Um, but I th look, I mean, we're getting into a very, very complex topic here in terms of, you know, organization, human organizations, which is, you know, formed, um, uh, you know, it, this is probably one of the most complex things in, in, in you, could, you could talk about in terms of the organizational dynamics that's formed by human civilizations, right? So you could say that the... Um, uh, a, a, a culture which is collectivist and, and passive in in its you know, in its programming, um, such as China. I'm, I'm, I'm grossly simplifying here, so I can already think of the you know the howling academics that would just go on. <laughs> you know, I'm grossly simplifying here, but yeah, but sure. the, the reality is that um, a culture like China, for example, because it's largely passive population, because it's largely collectivist in in their thinking would actually allow a very centralized regime to, to reign. So, so what I mean by that is like an authoritarian regime to reign because you know, the, the populace is compliant and everyone is sort of culturally in, ingrained to be compliant, right? So you're actually more likely going to get a strong man leader in China who dictates and dominates everything because the culture allows it to. Um, but however, you're more likely going to get a strong man leader in the population in the West, because the culture allows it to, so you're more likely going to find you know lead, people who will take charge, like your daughter. Um, you know, in you know, if you pick any random you know ten person from a Chinese population versus ten you know random from a Western population like Australia or, or, or US, the likelihood of you finding a strong man leader within that ten is much higher in the West. However, the most the likelihood of a dictator appearing in the east is a hell of a lot higher because uh, yeah, so it, it's um it's that sort of complex organization dichotomy, but which probably um I I, I don't know if it's re relevant to this conversation. However, um, it's just being aware of um every, your cultural programmings um. Uh, does have a massive impact even on your day-to-day -day, uh, relationships with people. And being able to master that, I think, is the key. I, and um, I think it's important to stress and, and that I don't believe is one right or wrong way. You know, um, culture is different to race. You know, so race, you can't choose. You know, your, your, your genetics, you can't choose. But culture is one where you can choose. Um, you can choose to live in a culture that suits your values that allows you to thrive. Um, and if I was being incredibly honest, um, my, um, my personality would almost mean that I would fail in Asia because I'm too direct, um, because I don't buy into the collective's mindset as much as I probably should. But it's all relative because compared to the Western population, I'm very um, cordial, I'm very 
passive <laughs> compared to a, a general Western population. So, you know, it's all relative. Now, the reason why, you know, in fact, I, I remember my mum would, would, would say to me you know, a Chinese expression that I lack a nerve, you know, so I can't detect when I'm doing something that's socially unacceptable <laughs> as a child. So, you know, so unfortunately that lands me in a bit of trouble in, 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 in Asia. And um, it doesn't, you know, sort of in terms of group dynamics, it, it doesn't uh, doesn't suit me. And so, ironically, I think I probably would have done better in the Western world than if I had stayed in in Asia. So that's mm. you know that's being incredibly done, done better as in more fulfilled, enjoying life more, or done better uh, in terms of career development. Oh, I love how you pick me up on that. Um, <laughs> nothing gets faster. Done better in terms of social status. Right, if we're being specific, so so I would have been seen as more of a leader in the West than if I had been in the East, because right. I don't I don't have the emotional or the EQ that allows me to succeed in the East. Yeah, okay, right. So you'd have hmm. you'd have the higher job title, you'd have the higher pay, you'd have the uh, whatever whatever status symbols uh, are relevant. More of that in the West than in the East. Now, this is cool. Yeah, the, the reason absolutely. I allowed the conversation to go down that kind of tangent is both because obviously it's something you're passionate about. You're holding back from it, which I understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I mean, this is really valuable for anyone who's listening to this, who is either of Asian background or has staff or team members or even colleagues, uh, mm -hmm. who are of Asian background as well, because yeah. there's only like, there's only so much that you're I mean, Jordan Peterson talks about this all the time. He gets so much flack for it, right? When talking about diversity, when talking about uh, inclusion, uh, and it's like you, just like what you're talking about, right? Like if you had 20 people, 10 from one particular cultural background, 10 from another, if you wanted to look for someone with a particular set of skills, whatever those skills are, you're much more likely to find it in one of the groups than the other. Now, yeah. maybe if you're making a team of just two people, maybe it will work when you've got like the best one person here and an average person there, like, you know, maybe that will work. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying if that's for like the qualities of both, like there's neither, which is better. No, than and, other, and, right? and this is the challenge, right? So this is the actual, the actuary in me coming out, right? Um, to explain this, you know, it requires a advanced understanding of statistics. And I love how you quoted Jordan Peterson because he's absolutely accurate. But it takes the audience to understand what he's actually saying. So what yes. he's saying is that what is true of a population doesn't say much for the individual. Now, you could say, you know, so, so what he says is something along the lines of, oh, look, you know, the chances are if you pick a random man and a random woman, the man is going to be um, uh, more uh, disagreeable 60% of the time or, or assertive, whatever word you want to use, 60% um, of the time. But it doesn't tell you anything about an individual now you you could potentially randomly pick the most aggressive um uh woman and and she would you know she could be incredibly successful um and and you know and but the 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 the, the statistics around the populations are still true and so uh, i suppose you know th this requires um a lot of nuance that unfortunately is lost in a lot of these you know short form content people are looking for that 30 second sound bite you know the, the reality is that, that i don't think uh, unless you really spend the time to understand what he's trying to say and and i know that's probably what underpins a lot of his popularity but i think uh to the vast majority of the public who doesn't have that attention span um, that's unfortunately lost in a lot of nuance now, but you did touch on a topic, another topic of mine, which is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a passion topic and it's about diversity. So when I say diversity, I mean, um, diversity, well, look, I'll have to try and define this because finding a set of language for something that is a bit ahead of the public narrative is, is very difficult. So I call this diversity 2.0. And I think uh, the closest uh, term that I can find in public uh, pop popular vernacular is, is intellectual diversity. So I, I'm a strong advocate of intellectual diversity because that's where the magic happens. That's where innovation happens. When you have people with different ideas, when you have people with different perspectives, values, experiences, when they bring it together, um, that's when you get genuine value creation that happens. However, genuine diversity is extremely messy and extremely uncomfortable. So this, this, uh, you know, this idea that diversity is about, you know, everybody holding hands and seeing Kumbaya is actually the opposite of it. Doing diversity is hard. 
It's meant to be hard because that's when it brings value, right? You don't do diversity to try and improve company cohesion. In fact, you do diversity to improve profits. <laughs> um, and I think that's lost in that. And so unfortunately, what you get is, is sort of putting the cart before the horse. Oh, let's just go out and hire women, right? But then what you get is women that basically thinks the same as the men um, and make decision pretty much as the men. And, and, and the chances are they're probably in the same socioeconomic status as you know the other male managers anyway. So if anything, you've reduced diversity of thought when you're trying to increase you know, diversity of these immutable physical characteristics. And so, um, yeah, so, so unfortunately, I think that that's where a lot of our current initiatives, you know, while it might have all the best intentions, mm -hmm. the outcome is just not living up to it. And so this is probably where I'm going to skirt on a bit of controversy, but I've attended um, conferences where, you know, people want to increase diversity of Asian Australian representation. But then I look around the room and I said, well, okay, that's well and great. There's a room of, you know, some very loud, very assertive, very westernized Asian Australians. Where's the other 90%? Where's the quiet leaders? Where's the, you know, where's the people who are incredibly analytical, but who can't string a sentence together to help their case forward? Now, they might know what the answer is, but we don't give them the room or the space or the attention span that they deserve to give you that answer. So unfortunately, I think um, where we're getting wrong in the whole diversity debate is that we're not meeting them halfway. We, we expect <laughs> the diverse people to meet us 100% of the way. And all we're doing is basically create physically diverse clones of the you know, of, of ourselves, of, of, of those who are already um, in charge. So, so we, di we, diversity of race is insufficient. Diversity of oh, culture is what you're striving for. Correct. Diversity of thinking. And and so what I would like to advocate, and and you know, you don't even don't even worry about race or gender. Like just start with how many introverts do you have in your leadership ranks? Right. In, in, by definition, half of us are introverts, right? I mean, I know it's all probably on a scale and again, cue the howlings of academics, but extreme, <laughs> extremely gross, grossly simplified. If you think about it, half of us are introverts. Now, is half of your leadership introverts? Well, if you're not, then why not, right? And the reality is that we tend to have a culture, especially in the West, where we see extroversion as a required leadership quality. And unfortunately, as a result of that, we are missing out on a hell of a lot of um, uh, intellectual diversity at the top. Right, the ability to analyze, the ability to reflect, the ability to empathize, the ability to um, introspect, right? And, and and you know this whole idea of the collaborative workplace. You know, if you look at the the new workplace of the future, you know, hot desks and you know um, uh, these common areas and all that. You know, they they're designed with extroverts in mind. So what you're actually saying to the introverts who might be incredibly valuable in giving good work to the company, what you're telling them is that we don't really care about you or the way you prefer to work. You know, so how can they be at their best when they're forced to be uncomfortable for eight hours of their life sitting you know, in a collaborative workspace? So uh, you know, this is the, the, the kind of... Uh, topics about diversity that we need to start talking about that I, I just don't believe is in the vernacular of the popular consciousness. And, and what I'm hearing you say is it's not, it's not so much just getting those people at the top of the company, it's getting their perspectives, it's getting their mm. insights. Because you, you probably find that someone who's very introverted, who probably has the answer and has a unique perspective, probably doesn't even want to be the one who's making the key decisions or where people are really dependent on them. Uh, or looking up to them. They probably don't even want to be in the spotlight or have a leadership role, which means you're probably just wanting to make sure that you're creating some form of system or framework or structure, even if it's, even if the person who's listening to this just has a team of five people and there's one very quiet person and they, they're hearing you sharing this and it's, oh, right, is that one? And let's just say, I'm generalizing, um, stereotyping. Let's just say that that particular person is Asian, Australian background mm -hmm. um, and, they were brought up being told that they shouldn't be outspoken. They shouldn't be pushing, like they shouldn't be pushing the boundary. They should just listen and they yep. should do their work. Don't and eventually the they're going to be recognized, right? Uh, yep. Eventually they'll be recognized. 
And it sounds like what you're saying is that in this diversity 2.0, it's mm-hmm. that that manager needs to be extra mindful to put equal weight to all of the different perspectives and ideas from all the different team members. Um, or uh, slight nuance there. Yeah, or, slight or nuance there. Sorry, sp- specifically recognizing that each of their members, as long as there's diversity of thought and ideas, needs to have the same level of voice or microphone time. Is that what uh, you're saying? I, I, don't, I don't know if equal is, is what we should be going for, right? right. So, so there has to be some level of competence and meritocracy involved. So the, the reality is that I think we can always do better on that front, right? So it's knowing who has that answer knowing that somebody who may be quiet may have the answer or that may be quiet because they don't know anything, right? Knowing the difference is why you should be, you know, the manager should be the one that knows the, 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 the difference. Now, one of the other cultural, um, uh, I suppose, assumptions that was instilled in the, the, the East, uh, the, you know, in, in the Asian um, in me is also the assumption of competence when you're in a position of power. And I, I guess, unfortunately, as we get older and, and, and have more gray hairs, you'll learn that that's not always the case, right? So um, in the East, we, we assume that if somebody is in a position of responsibility and power, that they got there through, uh, you know, what Jordan Peterson refers to as the competence hierarchy. You know, there is a competence hierarchy. And that's, that's you know, and, and unfortunately in the West, I just don't believe that's the case. And if anything, I believe we're heading in the wrong direction, especially with this uh, new sort of diversity initiative where they almost downplay that competence in, you know, and, 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 and you know, they, they almost lift up that, that physical, you know, sort of immutable characteristic as, as, as some sort of merit um, when it really shouldn't. What we should, <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of, um, it's the opposite of meritocracy. And in, in, in fact, you know, when you say, um, we should be promoting people based on anything other than merit. Now, you could argue, yeah, the definition of merit. Um, yes, I agree. But the definition of merit comes from, uh, if you want to improve the definition of merit, you need to increase intellectual diversity to ensure that you haven't missed perspectives and, and other things of value. Now, um, the, unfortunately, the nuance here is that, you know, again, this, this is a very complex topic. I believe what needs to happen is that we need to meet each other, meet each other halfway. So the extroverted leaders need to understand merit and give more, uh, you know, give the space for those with merit to be able to express themselves. The other side of the equation is those who are introverted has to learn how to articulate their ideas better. And this is where I, I'm advocating for um, more uh, training on how to structure information how to present information and how to communicate it effectively um, publicly. Now, you mentioned the 10 Lessons podcast, which we haven't covered yet, but one of the lessons that I had to share as one of my 10 lessons is the idea of find the truth and make it persuasive. Now, it's not enough that you know what the answer is. (laughs) Your job as the bearer of that information is to try and make everyone else understand why this is the right thing to do. And making something persuasive requires a lot of skill. It requires you to have an idea in its utmost clarity and being able to express that idea in a simplistic manner so that people will understand what you're trying to say. And, you know, it, it, you know, one thing I always refer to is um, Steve Jobs speaks about the idea of simplicity, right? The, The sophistication he says is in the simplicity of an iPhone. When you press that button, there's only one button on an iPhone, or it used to be anyway, only one button, but (laughs) that button does what you wanted to do when you wanted to do it. So the the, the sophistication comes from that, the simplicity. So for for, for them to design a phone with just one button requires them to be extremely sophisticated understanding of your user experience and and what what the user wants. So the same thing goes with communication. The, The sophistication is in understanding how to express a complex concept in a simple and clear term as possible. And that's something that introverts, analytical types, you know, people who are left brain has to learn to do better. Yeah, so that's that's my um, sort of, sh- <laughs> I don't know if I'm making it simple. But look, that's, that's- no, look, you're, you're, definitely, you're definitely touching on a topic that most people ignore or completely reject, right? The, mm-hmm. This idea that um, 
if you're not the most extroverted person, you probably have some of the best ideas because you've been you you can't you can't listen and talk at the same time, right? If you're talking, it's very hard to absorb what other people are hearing. You can't keep doing something and then also learning something new as well, unless you're doing the new thing exactly as you're learning it. But even still, like you can't multitask, right? You can't do <laughs> two things at the same time. You can just keep switching. So I mean, if you're listening and doing, listening and doing, listening and doing, great. That's one way to learn. But most most people uh, will start to think that you if you just keep the person who keeps talking all the time, it must be the person who has the ideas and the person who's the, the listener, if they've stayed with us for this song so far, um, who's hearing this is probably thinking, yeah, okay, great. Well, uh, that person's always coming up. with ideas. actually, maybe they're not the best ideas. And now they're, now they're in an environment where they recognize that they're in a, let's just call it a corporate setting. And the, the ideas that are being implemented are kind of stupid. And the people who are being promoted are the ones who are implementing those ideas. Uh, and they're more likely to hire other people surpassing you, right? We're talking back towards yeah. your career journey, right? And mm -hmm. the reason why you created the professional forum. Yeah. I mean, how do, how do people who are listening to this, who feel like they're more on the introverted side and they're not getting promoted or who feel like their culture, whatever their cultural background is, is mm -hmm. not being recognized in the organization? At what point do they try and change the way they're presenting themselves in the organization? At what stage do they try and choose a different organization that's going to be better for them? At, at what point does it come to, I need other people to help me and I need to do the things that are going to help me the most as well? How does, if, if someone's listening to this is asking those types of questions, mm -hmm. what advice do you give? Oh, that's a great question. And <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's probably one of the most talked about in the professional development forum. Um, ultimately, you know, do you change yourself or do you change your environment? Look, the, the answer, and again, unfortunately with nuance is, is a bit of both, right? You've got to pick the right environment for you. Now, if, if I was to have a time machine and give myself, you know, <laughs> advice and my, my 20 year old self, a bit of advice is to get out quicker when I did change my environment, you know, I, 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 I only realized after quite a bit of time that my values weren't aligned to the organization and the culture that I was operating in. Now, whether um, if I knew that earlier, whether it's because I wasn't aware of my own um, uh, sort of value, um, that that could be part of it. But the, the reality is that you know, changing environment made me uh, you know, had allowed me to have better alignment to you know so so allowed me to self-actualize a lot better than uh, the previous environment however um all along that journey i also worked on improving my communication with the outside world improving the way with you know again referring to jordan peterson how i grapple with the world and and you know part of growing up is that journey understanding what power you have to to change with you know what what's within your control how you present yourself now am i am i sort of um, changing myself, am I becoming a different person by becoming more articulate or assertive? Um, you know, some people may feel uncomfortable doing something um, that, you know, they, they're not naturally aligned to. But my, my view is that it's all part of the journey of growing up. Sometimes you just got to uh, learn how to do something because there is a greater purpose to why you're doing it. So going back to, you know, my Growing up, being told that you're not very good at English. Um, and, you know, again, I wasn't very articulate and I can't say I'm, I'm very articulate now, but I, I've worked on a lot of myself to become more persuasive because I realize that the message of what I know is important and it needs to be shared. Now, for, for many of us, um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of Asian Australians who's probably listening to the podcast that knows exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the, the challenges they have of communicating that cultural difference, but they've never ever had the language to be able to express that feeling because, you know, like I said, you know, the best thing I could come up with is trying to tell someone they live in the matrix. Right. And so for me is about learning the, these concepts or words or, or ways to explain these concepts so that other people could relate to, right? So the latest um, term that they've used is called, co uh, it's code switching, right? Code switching. Now it, it's a great one for Aussies because they love their football. You know, they've got league and they've got union, you know, while it looks the same to an untrained eye, they're very different games. 
right? So when you code switch, speaking you know, generally, of course, not all Aussies I, love their league and their football. Ah, uh, yes, of yeah, course. Gro gro gross simplification. Yeah, PQ <laughs> hells of <laughs> academics. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to find a way to communicate so that others could understand. You know the the, the experiences that I'm trying to to share. Um, and, and, and this is where, you know, I, I do run into a lot of trouble when you're speaking to people who has not experienced that personally, you know, why they need to meet us halfway. Um, and, you know, some of them, uh, just, just, you know, believe that their view of the world is the only view of the world. And that's, you know, that's probably a clear sign that they haven't been exposed to a hell of a lot of intellectual diversity, you know, and, and so that's, that's why I've come to the conclusion that, you know, we need to be, you know, when you say be comfortable being uncomfortable well intellectual diversity is exactly that you know you, you bombard yourself with ideas that you may not agree with or that you may have a prejudice against and and, and you know a particular disposition against but you need to learn how to process those ideas and look for things in these ideas that might be in your blind spots right so every time i approach a store a, a particular idea or a, a sensitive issue i'm always looking for well, what's the best argument against the position that i currently hold and and understanding that is part of my curiosity journey like i i need to know this in order for me to be satisfied that the position i hold is well thought out and so it's it's pretty cool what you're talking about here is both on the like the same thing almost the same thing applies to the micro level as what it does to more of the macro level right and, and we can go super macro right like your your personal life and what you your your personal actions especially in career but in all areas of your life mm -hmm. And then what an organization should do about these differences and then what the whole society ideally would do. Right. And I think you, I think you really nailed it in the simplicity of be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Now there's, there's a lot which still needs to be unpacked there, especially for people who aren't familiar with that type of topic, but it's ultimately just pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. Now in your journey, you, you shared earlier on that you started, especially when it came to uni. But then it sounds like further along the line as well, you started learning that most of your growth happened when you pushed yourself outside of your comfort zone. Do you want to share a few examples, maybe, maybe one from uni, maybe a couple from corporate environment, maybe something later on or more recent, mm -hmm. uh, that really highlights this idea of the growth that you'll have or the increase in success, however you define it, most likely fulfillment in this case, mm -hmm. yeah. um, by pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. Sure. Um, look, I mean, I can't really think of too much in my university days. I mean, I suppose I was, um, um, so I'm going to take, take you on the diversion here because that's just what I do. But, uh, the other day I was talking about the, uh, authenticity being, being an authentic person and what it's like being authentic, you know? And I, I said, look, being authentic, it's, it's like the no Nike swish logo, right? So you sort of, you start off being a completely authentic person because you're a child and you don't know any better, but then somewhere down the line, you got beaten into line and you're, you're this compliant person that has basically no personality or individual thought of your own. So that's the, the, the trough. And then as you get mature in your life, you realize that being your authentic self is your best self. And that's more like, you know, my, my personal journey there. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, so fortunately as, as a child, I was naive and, you know, like I was saying, lack of nerve. So I was actually far more authentic and far more, um, uh, I suppose, uh, yeah, comfortable being uncomfortable <laughs> as a child. But then somewhere down the line, I've lost all that. So I didn't push a hell of a lot of boundaries in my university days. And in fact, you know, I, I sort of didn't resist the parents' direction to go down the path of, you know, becoming, you know, sort of more uh, studying actuary and sort of going down that path. Um, well, three but it's and a half years later, you chose it. You changed that, right? There, well, there must yeah. have been a lot of pushback from your parents when that happened. Uh, yeah, there was a bit, but, but yeah, look, you know, it was my decision. I, 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 I just went and did it. Um, yeah, look, uh, okay, well, well, we'll take that as an example, but that's, uh, that's when I really reached a point where I just did not care anymore. <laughs> right. So it's, it's, you know, so most of my growth comes from, uh, basically being pushed over the edge. And so that was one incident. So, so yes, fair enough that that was what happened at university. So I changed paths, um, at work. Um, you know, there were, look, I, there were times when I was pushed beyond 
my limits and just basically lost my cool. But what can, I've realized is Can you give an example? That, like we don't need to share the, the company or the people or anything like that, obviously. But can okay. you share an example of that? Of, sure. Of yeah, cool okay. <laughs> push too far. Yeah. So look, you know, and again, Asian cultural programming, you know, you, we're not supposed to rock the boat. We're trying to keep harmonious. So even when people say something you don't like, you know, you kind of say yes, sir, no, you know, and, and yes, you know, and then you just sort of don't really raise an objection or run towards a conflict. Now, there was one point where I was just pushed too far that I literally just said, no, I can't take any more of this and just walked out of the meeting with a client. <laughs> And um, ironically, the next day, the client realized I've reached the bottom of my envelope and decided that that was the time to sign. So I, that was a, a very clear realization for me that had I lost my call three months ago, I could have got this contract signed. And and what yeah, was it? Was is, they were they just asking a whole bunch of stupid questions, or was there? Oh, look, they, they were trying to push to the point where they realize I can't move anymore. But because I kept my call because I, I kept doing what I thought was the right thing to do, you know, as instructed my culture, they thought, oh, well, he still has something in the bag. That's just pushing, prod him further, you know? And what I realized from that, uh, from that particular learning was that, well, actually, if you don't push back, people don't know that you, you know, you, that's it. That's how much you can take. But what I, the other thing I learned is that, you know, good things happen when you stand up for yourself, right? And when you, when you assert yourself, and, and that that sort of began a, a journey for me to become more and more authentic as I as I as I went. You know, when I started acting more um, instinctively. Yeah. You know? <laughs> now, you have to understand how hard that is for an Asian person because acting instinctively is a sign of immaturity. <laughs> At least that's how I was taught. Right. So a, a mature person would not react <laughs> with you know emotions because it means that you can't control your emotions. But in the West, you know, if you're not acting with the requisite emotions, you're not authentic. I can't trust this person. He's hiding something. He's, he's disingenuous. And so it's, it's really, you know, it's a really fine line. So for me, I almost have to read as to what their expectation of me is before I choose what my emotional response is. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so, that, so, that's the maturity part, right? Mm. Like the maturity isn't don't express any emotion. The maturity is to express the emotion the right way at the right, the right time for the right people. That's right. That's right. And, and, and so, and, and, and again, just to draw the cultural differences, right? So if you're negotiating against Kore South Koreans, for example, you know, that, that would obviously be, you know, that you have to make sure the emotions are shown, you know, just sort of toned right down. You, you negotiate with Aussies, you have to show some level of emotion, right? But if you negotiate with, you know, let's say the extreme end of the scale, Italians or Spanish or, you know, they're very expressive cultures or the French, right? Then you almost have to exaggerate your emotions to make sure that they understand exactly, you know, and for them, it's, it's, it, it's almost like a role play, you know, it, it, you have to enjoy the moment, you know, you have to show that you are, you know, you, you almost have to play, you know, exaggerate. It's, it's like you're on stage, right? And and that's a that's a very different cultural, um, you know. And so you could just imagine if the extreme ends are, are negotiating with each other and they have no appreciation of their cultural differences, you know, that, that the, the kind of challenges that would lead to. Now, unfortunately, you know, most of us, um, you know, kind of get it, but don't aren't really um, consciously doing. The, the, the bridging culturally. And when you're not consciously doing it, you know, sometimes you, you kind of lose the, the control uh, of, and, and, the, and the context of what you're trying to send. So there are situations where I've witnessed where, you know, one party is trying to show respect and the other party reads it completely, in, you know, as in, yeah, they, they must be, uh, they're very uh, duplicitous when in reality, all they're trying to do is not offend the other party. Yeah, I remember Sorry. even even if you like this is with every culture, right? You're talking difference between South Koreans and Americans mm -hmm. and Italians, Europeans. Like even with even with Russian culture, like with people who are growing up Russian, um, mm -hmm. you if you're smiling, they'll start thinking that you're laughing at them. It's like what are you laugh like? Why are you smiling? Like what are you laughing at? Like what are you laughing about? As opposed to yeah. no, I'm smiling because it's courteous and it's nice. Like it's polite <laughs> to smile to someone. It means that you like them. It's like no, you must be laughing at me. So it's do you just map your actions towards what you're seeing the other person doing? As in like you just match and mirror, or do you try and anticipate what their uh, what their type of experience would be or what their 
what their type of upbringing has been because that's mm-hmm. that's fraught with danger as well right absolutely and and look and, and that sounds like manipulation uh, let's be honest so um uh, look i i think the the key here is just being aware right so if something's not working this is a framework um, this could be why, and, and you've just got to ask yourself the right questions at the right time. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, every person you use stereotype, right. Yeah. Um, and, and try and uh, behave in a way. And, 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 and again, you know, you're dealing with individuals. You, you don't know if you don't know anything about their culture or their upbringing, Yeah, you know, they, they, you know, they could be Italian, but they could have grown up in China. Right. And, and so they, they may be culturally one way versus another. So, you know, that you can't, you can't stereotype or, you know, with these cultural un- underpinnings, what you should do is be aware of them. So when something happens, you've got to ask yourself the question is, this, could this be the reason why they took this the wrong way? And when, when you have that awareness, then you've got the ability to adjust as you go. Um, and so, you know, part of it is having a framework to do so. Um, and yeah, I keep referring to the matrix example. So if you're not even aware of it, then you'll never think of that as a possibility. Whereas if you're aware of it, then you can say, okay, check. It's just one of many things you got to check. Sometimes they just don't like your product. Sometimes they don't like you. Sometimes it's miscommunication, but you know, having that in your framework when you're trying to understand is incredibly important. Now I'm going to just go on a segue about listening because you actually mentioned listening before. And, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, in fact, there's a really cool um, person I spoke to before who spoke about the five levels of listening, you know, and it's, you know, first, you know, just listening to the words is just, that's just one level listening for, you know, um, uh, oh God, I, I don't remember what the five levels are, but ultimately there's a level where you're listening for what they mean, you know, so you're listening for what they say, listening for the context, listening for what's not said, listening for what they, you know, trying to say but you're also listening for what they ultimately mean there's a different levels of listening so now I'll just, I'll just i'll just look it up quickly actually um, yeah go for it then we'll, uh, then we'll have oscar it um yeah okay uh, uh, is it ignoring listening pretending listening selective listening so, attentive listening empathetic listening no Something so that's else. five types of listening uh five levels now it's, it's five levels of listening uh let me let me get oh, that in go. front of me there's as well Oscar Trimboli, five levels of listening. Here we go. Give him a good plug because he's a brilliant, brilliant man. And so what, what are the five levels? Um, it's okay. So the first one, the first level is, uh, okay. Level one is listening to yourself. Level two, listening to the content. Level three, listening to the context. Level four, listening to what's not said. And level five, listening for the meaning. Now, what I realized through this exercise is that as a, as a, as a young child in New Zealand, where I'm basically learning a new language, right? So this is my first exposure to English when I was 10 years old. I realized that there's a hell of a lot of meaning you can decipher even when you don't understand words. So I became, um, I became quite a, um, I suppose an expert listener. Even though, you know, even though there are so many words, I have no idea what the definition is. I can, I can work it out based on everything else, based on the gesture, based on the context, based on the tone, based on everything else, I can work out what it means. Um, and so it almost instinctively became a bit of a skill of mine to, to, to be a good listener. And, 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 um, you know, and, and that's something that I think, you know, I suppose anyone that's had to, you know, be, plucked and 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 moved into a different culture they would pick up some of that listening skill as well but if you haven't ever been able to do that um or if you if you've never been forced to to operate in a in a language that you don't understand then i actually think that you know you don't necessarily have the exposure to the uh, you know to the good listening skills that you would otherwise have so highly recommended you know if you can <laughs> take a child out and put them in a in, in a different culture and then you know learn the language and by by that you also learn how to listen properly now that's only half the equation so be, just because i was able to understand and decipher the meaning doesn't mean i can express it back and this is what we were talking about before so the other half of you know my my when, when a mentor is you know find the truth which is you know you do through listening and make it persuasive now why is that second part important well once you understand what it is um, the challenge is for you to distill that information um, organize it and then present it back 
to the person that you're trying to convince. Now, again, the same cultural barriers exist when you're trying to present a piece of information, right? Because the other person, you don't, you know, you, you, you have to work out how they want that information structured, how, how they want to present it and how, how they how to motivate them in the way that connects with them emotionally. And again, this is different from culture to culture. So, so just, just quickly on this one, because you used the term about five minutes ago, you used the term manipulation and mm -hmm. used it as with a tone, as though mm -hmm. you have a, like, as though it's aligned with a negative implication. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you define the difference here between manipulation and the influence? And because a lot of what you're saying, right? Because ultimately, mm -hmm. understand, like, you've got to be empathetic, even if it's in a narcissistic way, you got to be empathetic yeah. to understand how someone else is feeling before you're able to help change the way that they act yeah uh, so what how do you define the difference between manipulation versus influence here because i'm sure that a lot of your your cultural wiring or cultural conditioning mm. has probably told you to avoid both of them right yeah look and and great pick up um nothing gets past you i love it um look i, I guess for me uh, the definition is intent right so manipulation means that you know you're you're you're, you're doing it to serve yourself whereas i suppose influence is to serve others so i mean it goes back to the purpose why you're trying to do this um look uh if, if I was to be honest, I, I think the, the process is pretty much the same manipulation or influence. Um, you know, manipulation does come with a negative um, connotation in terms of the, the, the definition. The process is roughly the same, but the difference is the intent. Um, so, yeah, if you're manipulating people, you, you're doing it to serve yourself. If you're influencing people, you're doing it to serve others. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And so if we... If we bring this back to the topic of how to be more successful, mm -hmm. um, you were you were sharing some ideas of how you recognize that, um, that that's where you learned the lesson of not just listening, but also being able to present yourself back in a way of that other people are going to respect, right? So as opposed mm -hmm. to playing a cool, playing a cool, playing a cool, then going, no, nah, I've had enough of this. This is this is it. Take it or leave it. And then they mm -hmm. find the acceptance. Oh, okay, that's a that's a nice win. Like that's that's amazing. And I'm sure that anyone who's listening can start to apply that with their manager or with the future job that they apply for and those types of things as well. They've got to be able to recognize that they need to stand up for themselves and also uh, articulate and present the way that they're actually feeling as well. Like that's how you stand up for yourself. It's not just you've got your boundary and then you just kind of avoid it and run away if it's hit. It's going, no, this is my boundary. And then yep. challenging their boundary as well. Because yep. you were saying intellectual diversity is actually hard it increases profits <laughs> it doesn't increase ease right what, that's right what other lessons have you learned over the years uh specifically mm -hmm. which have fought against your upbringing good so I, I should i should probably just frame something quickly for, for people who are listening when i when i'm asking these types of questions it's because anyone who's had a successful experience of life ultimately that they're enjoying themselves that they're creating a sense of impact on other people and that they've got resources that they're able to employ right finances and the like and they're able to mm -hmm. also have a better quality of life as well at the same time it's always because they've learned things over time like there's no way that if you look at anyone who you really admire anyone that you admire or look up to or really respect uh, there's no way that they were just born with all the stuff that they have there's no way that they learned it all just from their just from their parents or from their social circles as they were growing up either they've yeah. They've had to push away from, from the norm of who they've been. They've had to go, no, no, that part of me needs to stay on the side. I need to start growing. Or this is me. I need to go like this. And so it's time mm -hmm. to start learning. It's start to, time to start being more intentional about who you spend time with and who you connect with and all those types of things, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's the scary part, right? Like needing to push beyond your comfort zone. I love that you raised it twice already. Uh, mm -hmm. pushing beyond that comfort zone, finding a new way of being you in order mm -hmm. to get to live the life that you actually want to live want. is really yep. valuable. So I'm asking these questions to you specifically because if people are listening to this and going, especially if they're, especially if they're Asian background or if they or if they <laughs> recognize that they have a, hopefully it's more broad, like hopefully they recognize that there's a cultural difference from what, where they've come from to the yep. environment in which they're operating. Hopefully if they learn from 
your experiences of, oh, that was the experience that taught Jeff how to do this and this. That was the experience okay. that taught Jeff how to do this. That they'll, maybe it will be more applicable for them and they'll be able to apply it in their own life as well. So that's, uh, you, that's the purpose. It, it, hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah, there, there was a missing step and I, I know exactly what you're talking about now. Look, as much as I'm an Asian person, that's part of my identity, but I'm also a person. Right. Fundamentally, there, there are things which are universal to us all, and it's all part of growing up. You know, I'm growing up. Yes, I'm growing up as a Asian kid. You know, we're just trying to understand his place in the world, understanding who I am, what makes me tick, and all that. And a big part of it, um, and again, I have to keep going back to Jordan, Dr. Jordan Peterson, but he talks about this idea of the hierarchy of values. Right. What are your things that you care about and how important they are in order? Now, there's an exercise you can do where, you know, you get a, a stack of 50 values cards, you know, and you're trying to eliminate them until I'm not sure if you've done these. But if you have the first time I've done it, it was just such an excruciatingly difficult exercise. Because we, we, kind realize... of make our, we kind of make our clients do it in sometimes like we, we give them a list of maybe it's even more than 50 in a pre-work mm. survey. Select yep. the ones like the top 10 or whatever. And then the next question, of course, is, okay, let's narrow those down. What well, are the top five? five. Yeah, five. yeah, I hate that. And thing. now order them. <laughs> order them. Which ones? Order them. Yep. Order out of these five. So and ordering them, um, it's incredibly, uh, for me, the reason why I was excruciating is because I have to choose, yeah, family or um, or my car or something. I don't know. Like there, there's all these different values. Like, oh, and everyone is so important to me, but it's that ordering, the, the, the process of elimination. If you can only have one, what would it be? Um, Family or and, car, and, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, maybe. Well, that's an easy one for me, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But um, that exercise me, made me realize I was so misaligned from my one-up manager because he, he's the one that made me do it. And I looked at his values. I looked at mine and thing. That's exactly why <laughs> I'm not going to be around anymore. Um, but but it was really, really excruciating. Now, what, why I kept going on about how excruciating this, this is, is because that's where the growth occurred for me when I realized what made me tick, you know. And then when I was saying that before where my friend told me that I was at my best when I was helping others, and that's when, it, the, again, the aha moment for me was understanding that hierarchy of values allowed me to act. The reason why I was so I was finding it so painful to let go of certain things is, is because I was chasing the things that I think I wanted, or people told me that I wanted, and I thought that was you know the things that I need to chase, you know, the wealth or um, you know prestige. You know, I want people to think that I'm a successful person. You know, I, I and then after after a while I realized, I oh, know I never actually wanted that <laughs> i just thought i did because that's what i was told that that's what's important you know i need to you know keep up with the joneses i need to have respect i need to have followers and clicks and likes and um money and this car and that job and all that sort of stuff on and the big house you know you're in singapore i don't know if you know what the five c's are right but that's you know that's that's the things that they think that are, are important um, and, and that's a sense of you know, how successful you are as a person. But that exercise, um, was that, was that like the, if I remember that correctly, that was like the mm. car, condo, all the, all yeah. the cash, right? cash. Okay, that's yeah. it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I so, so it's, it's all the, yeah, <laughs> it's all the things that you think you wanted. Um, but it was excruciating for me to finally give up those things that I thought I wanted and, and pursue the things like family relationships and, you know, all the things that, that, that ultimately, you know, service was actually one of my highest values. Um, and, you know, but I had to give up something in order to have that as my highest value. And what I had to give up, if, you know, was something that I thought was really important, which is, you know, I think it was career or something along those lines. Um, and so once I had that clarity, it allowed me to act and choose, you know, when you're saying, you know, choosing what, who you spend time with, what you do, what you focus on, you know, you're, you're, and until you have that clarity, you will not be able to act. You know, how do you know when to, you know, um, stand up for yourself? Well, when you, when, you know, they cross a the line uh, where, where it's one of your non-negotiables. Now, had I been, you know, and again, this is, if I could give myself and my younger self advice is to work out what your values were earlier. Now, whether I, whether they have changed over time, maybe, maybe they've changed over time as well. But 
you know, I think it's important to have that clarity. And once you have that clarity, then you can act. And then it, was, it became much easier for me to know where my, <laughs> where my non-negotiables are and sticking up for myself was easy after that. And it's not just sticking up for myself. It's also knowing that it's about others. So um, one of the point of realization where I realized that I had to go and advocate. Now, advocacy was something that wasn't easy for me because I hate being in the firing line. I hate attention, right? But this before, is, this before is... we, I'm really keen to hear about the advocacy, yeah. but before we even get there, can we, I'm really curious about that, about the situation or the circumstance or the mm -hmm. context of when you had that friend or peer uh, tell you, uh, you're at your best when you're helping others. What, what, oh, what led okay. to that insight? Uh, I'll, well, part of the exercise I was doing was the values inventory, and the other part is is a survey that I had to send out to to my friend. Now, why I was doing it was because the company was going through a restructure at the time, and at the time, I yeah, look, I it was a low point in my career. I felt like I was um, just wasn't going anywhere. Um, and as I found out later, I had a completely misaligned um, leadership <laughs> to, to who, where I was. Um, but that exercise actually gave me the clarity I need to made me realize that I was completely misaligned to you know, my values, to their values, um, and I was in the wrong place. Um, and hence my complete dissatisfaction from where I was. Um, so at the time I had very little confidence as well. So I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like I had an option, you know, to, if I, if I was to lose a job, I didn't feel like I could land anywhere. Um, so incredibly frustrated. And so that's why I, I went un underwent this, uh, this exercise and, you know, but it was probably one of the best things that happened because once I knew what was important to me, then I knew what, to, where to aim my efforts and where I went, but also knowing that career wasn't important to me allowed me the yeah you know, the courage to kind of put it on the line and you know perform some pretty career limiting moves <laughs> in 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 sort of um uh, in pursuit of my advocacy you know which is what sort of led me to that advocacy thought and the second thing that happened um was also the birth of my first child because there was a point where i realized i can't look him in his face and realize that he's going to face the same limitations i faced because if I did nothing, you know, he's going to, you know, nothing's going to get better. Nothing's going to change. Um, and that's when I realized that, you know what, if, if I don't like the way things are, then I need to do something about it. Because if I don't, I can't, I can't look at my son in the face and, and say, you know, Hey, <laughs> sorry, mate, you know, you're just going to have to suffer the same thing I did. So there, so I'm a, I'm a dad, I've got two daughters, mm. uh, three and a half years old and eight months old. It'll probably be different by the time I release this episode, but by the way, mm. um, and even though I run a company called Purpose Advisory, I, uh, I've always had a purpose, but I've always known that the purpose mm. is going to change considerably. And for myself, it's been a very, very big shift since having, mm. since having daughters to recognize what my actual purpose is. It's to, it's to make sure that they have an incredible experience of life, that they are not just incredible experience, but that they have safety and opportunity mm -hmm. wherever they are. Now, my interpretation of that, like, yes, I do a lot of things for outreach, right? I do a lot of things to help shift and change the world. Ultimately, as you can mm -hmm. tell this, this podcast, great example, the, the business itself, we've, we've chosen an impact over profit many times. Um, every, almost everything which I do is, is aligned with creating a broader impact, but I don't need to make the world a safer place for them by changing everybody else. Mm -hmm. I've realized that I can make the world a safer, more beautiful place for them by helping them make their world safer and more beautiful, yep. equipping them with the resources and the skills to be able to choose where they live. is a big one mm -hmm. to yep. be able to, to be able to stand up for themselves and choose where they actually want to be, to yep. be able to identify what they might actually want to do and recognize that what you choose to do when you're 18 years old is probably going to be very different to what you actually want to do when you're 30 or 40, right? Yep. And so for me, that's been a very big thing. Most, what I found with most people when they start to go, no, 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 I've just got to make sure that like I've had kids and now my purpose is different. I've got to make sure that I focus on uh, giving them, like make, making sure I'm setting them up. Most people tend to think really small, right? Like they tend mm -hmm. to think, well, I've just got to make sure that, that they're not going to be in debt when they're young or that they can buy a house or that they have education. And that's kind of like the extent to which they think of it. 
-hmm. And what I love by what you just shared, which is why I interjected, is you're automatically, like you started viewing this as, I've got to get to advocacy. If I want to make mm -hmm. my, if I want to make my son's world better, I've actually got to change the world, which is huge, <laughs> right? Not, not to protect them though, mind you. Um, and, and I think I just want to point out some of the nuances. So, you know, it's not that the world's all, you know, unicorns and rainbows, right? right? It's that they are so much tougher and stronger than they think they are, that they can withstand it. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's no surprise where that comes from. You know, Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about this. Um, that you know, the, we, we, the we can to, have a few plugs this time, don't we? I know. You, you, you know, he's probably got to send us some of his royalty checks for his book. But um, <laughs> look, it, it, one one of the, the messages that resonated with me the most is, is is exactly that. You know, what every child, what every parent needs to know is it's not that you know the the, the world's going to roll over and all of a sudden become great for your child. You know, it's going to be tough. There's going to be suffering. You know, there's going to be pain. You're going to have to, but you, the way you prepared your child to be able to grapple with that is to make them realize the inner power that they have. And part of that is, is leading by example. What I realized was that the reason I wasn't able to be um, impactful before was because I was thinking about myself. You know, when I changed the mindset that I'm doing this for my son, for the, you know, for, for others, the impact I had was, it was immense. You know, there was something, and maybe this is just the way I'm wired. When I'm doing it for myself, you know, I, and I know I'm doing it for the wrong motivations. I don't, I'm not as convincing. I'm not as convicted. I'm not as persuasive. But when I'm doing it for my child, it might be the same message. It might be the same outcome, but the impact is phenomenally different, you know, and, and maybe it's just the way I feel about it, but I, it definitely gives me great motivation, you know, like, you know, sort of, you know, I, I realize that I'm doing something that's far greater than myself. And that gives me, you know, I suppose it gives me the courage to actually go and do something that I'm obviously very uncomfortable with. Yes. Right. right. So you find the inspiration, the motivation from being able to do it for others. So do you others. think, do you think that's because of the collective upbringing that you had or was it yeah it's because of that not because of personality it, oh both look it's a bit of both right it, it, it collectives upbringing but i think it's also just the way i'm wired i just can't do something like that to serve myself and still feel okay about it i think it's uh, and but but what i do find power you see the thing is you know when you talk about advocacy you know and i know some people might enjoy they might just like the attention they might like the you know the what we call you know, like they might feel good doing something that, you know, they feel is right and, and all power to them, you know, if they're making the world a better place, but I can't, I need to know that I'm motivated by something more than myself. I need to know that ultimately there's a reason why I'm doing this. All right. So to take the example of self-promotion. So, you know, we, we talked about before that, you know, you need to do a good job, but you need to tell everybody that will listen that you've done a good job. Knowing that to doing it is two different things now. <laughs> For me, I still find it incredibly uncomfortable to self-promote. In fact, when you're introducing me, you know, tell me about your journey. I still can't. Yeah, you know, it's just something about me that I feel like as soon as I start talking about myself, um, it's boastful. It's it's you know, it's seen as a bit of a it's frowned upon in our culture. You know, and and I still don't feel comfortable doing it. But you know what I can do? I can I can sell somebody else. I can I can talk you up. <laughs> I can talk up every other Asian person that I know who has a you know who has a great um, a career and potential. And so what I've learned is that, you know what, I, maybe I don't need to be a great self promoter, but I can promote everybody else around me who I know have great merit, who aren't very good at promoting themselves. And that's what I've been committing myself to do, to promote those around me who are doing awesome things, who I believe have leadership potential to make a positive impact. And that's something that I'm very passionate about. Okay. And so that that definitely that definitely explains a lot more of the context towards creating the professional development forum as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about that about that step? Sure. So, uh, like I said, you know, it may have started with uh, out of frustration. It may have started out of you know self advancement, maybe all the wrong motivations. But as the years went on, um, we heard from some incredible speakers, and and I remember there was one that really really. Um, uh, Sort of change my view of the world, and uh, the the speaker's name was uh, and Andrew Tyndale, who was a very successful investment banker until two thousand and eight, 
you know, um, the big GFC came basically lost, you know, sort of most of what he's had. And uh, he basically shared the journey of the, the, the last days of Batcock and Brown. And uh, it was an incredible story. Um, what came out of that was probably the most inspiring thing where he realizes that he's got the skills to make the world a better place using what he knows about finance and then, um, you know, and, 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 and impact finance. And, you know, he can use that to solve um, some of the worst problems in the world. Um, I was incredibly inspired by that particular story. You know, part of it is knowing how well, it's, it's, it's a genuineness in, in, you know, describing that process. You know, nobody's, uh, not a lot of us could say, you know, that they've been in through uh, that sort of, you know, great height and, and all of a sudden crash down to the middle. But it, it's that, it's the purpose he found that, that really changed my um, outlook on, you know, my worldview on, on what to search for. So that's part of that journey. Um, I, I guess, you know, again, referring to Dr. Jordan Pearson, he, he's got this lesson, right? Um, uh, pursue what is meaningful ra rather than what's expedient. I mean, that's basically the same lesson. Um, but by that time, I, I was already aware that, you know, the, the purpose of life isn't to garner great wealth, but it's what you do um, with the, the God-given talents uh, that, that you have within you. Um, and once I had that mindset in, you know, everything just made sense right? in my, in my life, everything made sense in my world. And what I realized was that my ability to influence those around me, it just exponentially increases. You know, I, I didn't realize that the, the kind of influence I had with, you know, sort of my immediate people around me. And even today, you know, sometimes I'll talk to someone who I've never met, who will come up to me and say, look, you know, I follow you on LinkedIn and I'm like, why? <laughs> Why? Why are you following me? I don't think <laughs> but but the, the the answer is actually very insightful mm -hmm. um, it, because they resonate with, uh, I suppose, my experiences and, and also my observations of, of the world and the fact that you know I try to speak from the heart and, and, and say what I believe to be true, you know. And God, I can't get away from it. But you know, another another rule of life is you know don't. Don't speak the truth or at least not don't lie right and um i find incredible power in speaking the truth because you know this is this is a classic um the emperor's had no clothes right it doesn't matter how powerful the king is when the boy says hey he's naked <laughs> it's the truth yeah. and there, there's incredible power to speaking truth um uh, I, I think, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us has lost sight of that. Mm -hmm. um, and but what I did find is that the more truthful I am, the uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. You know, I can't say I'm a hundred percent, you know, fully expressed individual. <laughs> I'd, I'd be worried but, if you started saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, the more truthful I am, the, the more I feel like I'm aligned with my purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so are you saying that professional development forums started out of frustration mm -hmm. and then it got you realizing that you can, you can actually be more purposeful as a result of it. So it, yes. sound, it sounds like it almost, almost sounds like it started with frustration. You're looking very inward. You're looking at me, 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 what mm -hmm. do I, blah, 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 frustrated. And then you started hearing some of the speakers that you were bringing on to help others and mm. then you start to be like, oh, wait, I actually, I actually really am passionate about helping others. I can be really impactful there. So. Yeah, yeah you, you probably told it better than I could tell myself, but yeah, that's exactly what happened. So we, um, later on, we actually had um, a coming together and real, realigned our mission. Uh, and our mission was about helping others to find fulfillment in the modern Australian workplace just helping young professionals find fulfillment in the modern Australian workplace. And it wasn't happiness. It wasn't promotion. It wasn't power. It wasn't status. It was about fulfillment. And what does fulfillment mean ultimately is, is different to everybody, you know? So for some, it's about contribution. It's about knowing that you've made a positive difference for some, it, look, it is about money and status for some, if, if that's what they were looking for. Um, but I think fulfillment, you know, it's a couple of things, right? And um, it's about having the the it's about having that responsibility. It's about having the mastery to be good at your craft, and it's about you know achievement and making a, a difference, you know. Um, and I, I believe that's universal. Um, 
Yeah. So, so, and that's what I'm preaching. And, and I, I believe that if that message can get out to more young professionals, they will suffer less and, and find fulfillment faster. How will that make them suffer less, right? You're, you're talking about mm -hmm. having responsibility, mastering good craft. So basically take responsibility to improve yourself, improve yourself, and mm -hmm. then take the responsibility to take action with how you've improved yourself. How will that make people more successful, more fulfilled in modern Australian workplace? Okay. So rather than pursuing power status position, all right, you pursue mastery, you pursue meaning, you pursue, you know, um, uh, yeah, making a difference, right? And, and understanding that that's what ultimately brings fulfillment is what's going to be the difference between a satisfying career versus a job <laughs> that you hate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess this, this aligns yeah. nicely with Ikigai, right? I assume you've, mm -hmm. have you come across it before? Sorry, um, Ikigai? Yeah, Ikigai. Um, oh, yes, yes. The Japanese concept of yeah. being aligned with your purpose, uh, yeah, what you exactly. put on this earth for. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, which, 100%. Which very much aligns here. For, the, for those who are listening who haven't heard it, it's basically what you love. Um, it, like, do you, what do you you're love good at, or do you enjoy What people it? need and what you get paid for. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And if you find some overlap or a nice big overlap between all of those four, with clients, we get them to rate each of them out of 10. If you get all of them as close to 10 as possible, knowing that you'll never get all to 10 and that there's always going to be, there's always going to be sacrifices and trade-offs in order to get there. Uh, do you see any difference between that concept and how you've defined fulfillment or do you see this almost perfectly aligned? Oh, look, I, I think it's a very good framework, right? I, I think that's a very good definition. Look, I, like you said, it never, it'll never be a hundred percent perfect. Um, but, um, if you're fortunate enough to be close to it, then, uh, you, you know, right. Um, but I, I think a lot of, um, a lot of it, it's, you know, it's just up in the, in, in your head. It's understanding that. So, um, when I say, f um, the mindset shift, you know, you could have the same job, you could be doing the same thing, making the same amount of money with the same amount of, you know, status and power and whatever. But if you're under, if you, if you're pursuing the right things, you will be far more fulfilled doing exactly the same thing. Does that make sense? And, yeah. and sometimes people don't realize um, there is value. There's a hell of a lot more value to what they are actually doing. Um, you know, and, and I'll attribute like, you know, I, I tend to respect certain, you know, there's some people who does certain things, you know, nurses, doctors, um, even, even the garbage collector, like, you know, it's, it, like I, I see a lot of value, like they're making the world a better place because there's a job that they do and they go and do it. Param, paramedics, right? Like that, that's yeah. one of those jobs that are higher in my list, you know, because they put themselves in, in harm's way to save lives. Yes, you know, uh, conditions might not be great, but there is a, there's a sense of fulfillment there that you don't see in other professions, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, that, that's why I, I do look up to people who have that sense of fulfillment, um, because I, you know, I do respect a lot of the contribution, but I, I, I fundamentally, I think the difference is once I start recognizing that I realize that as long as you make a contribution and that, you know, that you're making a contribution, no one can make you feel little <laughs> about what you do. Does that make sense? So, so, um, it doesn't matter if you're a garbage collector. Right. So long as you know the difference that you're making, I don't care. Like no one's, no one can make you feel, um, uh, sort of worthless. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, it, is that, is that what you were running away from in much of your life? Hmm. Like this feeling of being worthless? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the, the, yeah, pretty much. So, so even like, so, so, um, the, 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 the reverse side of that is that you could be making a shit ton of money and be very incredibly successful in the conventional terms. But if you don't have that sense of fulfillment, it's still not enough. You know, I mean, I know, I know they're, you know, very high profile cases, you know, and I hate to sort of, um, talk about Anthony Bourdain, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is according to the great Dave Chappelle. This is a guy that eats for a living, you know, has all the money and the fame has the best job in the world. And yet somehow he doesn't, feel like he can go on. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously I don't know the, 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 the case with him, but you know, I, I guess the, um, you know, the, it doesn't mean that, you know, these trappings of success or, or the traditional definition of success is enough for you to find fulfillment. Yeah. I mean, I, I had that same view about Robin Williams, 
until oh, I until I God until, I, interview, yeah. until mm-hmm. I interviewed a guy named Chris Rain. He founded mm-hmm. uh, Hello Sunday Morning, Daybreak App, all, all that kind of stuff. is is pretty impressive mm-hmm. in terms of what his journey's been. He he faced um, uh, he was drinking too much. He wasn't an alcoholic, but drinking too much. Now he helps people with that. And he actually stepped down mm-hmm. from there, and now is more involved in the GP side of things and making sure it integrates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. And so he his when I raised that with him, he said he actually knows Ron Williams' son. And wow. he says the people are very quick to judge in that regard, right? People mm-hmm. kind of like, whatever, like he, he cut his life too soon, it was a bad thing to mm-hmm. do, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, realistically, his, Robin Williams lived more life and did more in his life than most people would do if they had 10 of their own lifetimes. And so that comes to mind, like thinking just, what do you actually want out of your life? And I don't know if we're ever right to say when, like, if we if we have the right to say when someone's lived enough life or not, uh, or mm. how to measure one's life. Uh, but yeah, when we we obviously get emotionally impacted when someone who's had an impact on our lives leaves, or when they're no mm. longer around, because we keep yeah. wanting more from them. I wonder how much of that is because, yes, we're inspired by them, but we're also inspired by them because we don't believe enough in ourselves to be able to experience it without them there anymore. That's a great, yeah, that's a bloody good point. Look, I, I, th- I think in the, again, we don't know the, I, I don't know Robin Williams, I don't know his personal sort of circumstances, um, but you know, I, what we do know is that they, he felt that there wasn't enough purpose for him to go on. Yes. Um, and and that's something that I think it's tragic, even if he's already lived a full life. Agreed. Um, yeah. So so uh, now there are talks about whether you know he was um, he was addicted to approval. He was um, he needed that, and he just never felt that he was enough. Um, I, you know, look, there's so much that we just don't know about him. I don't know if we're actually in, even going to be in a position to judge him. But if it is the case that he's addicted to the approval, then, you know, is it really fulfilling? You know, did he really have a fulfilling life? If if what he did was great, and, and yes, it won a lot of approval, but is that because of his narcissistic sort of need for that attention and an approval? Or is it because he genuinely just wants to entertain the world for, the, you know, for to serve the others? You know, is it about the... And so, um, what, what, whatever his motivation is, I guess is irrelevant. But uh, I think it is a tragedy that he didn't feel like there was enough to to live for, um, because you know, I, I've, I, you know, my my view is that if he felt like there, there could have been more fulfillment in his life, he, he would have stuck around. I I, I tend to agree, um, mm. and I think it's tragic regardless. Um, mm. I'm. So I'm, I'm curious from your perspective then, right? We're, we're talking a lot about how you help people with their careers and with what they're doing. And you've, you have a, you have a very kind of impact oriented lens uh, or view and, or leaning, I guess you'd say. And so your leaning is definitely towards making sure that you're helping other people live better and live better mm-hmm. lives. Uh, you've, you've got a son. Do you have other kids as well? Or just your son? Oh, I've got two sons. You've yeah. got two sons, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the best way to find like the real life lessons that you want to share. I mean, what, what beliefs or conditionings do you want to instill in your sons? If, I don't know, if, if tomorrow you were to uh, touch wood, if there is a yeah, touch wood, <laughs> if you, if tomorrow you were no longer to be around and you were, you were gone, you're hit by a bus and your sons mm-hmm. uh, decide to, when they get older, they decide to start consuming all of your, all of your content and everything which you put out there <laughs> and, and you really want them to hear a specific message, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And they and you want them to be reminded of something. What what beliefs do you want to instill in them? What do you wish that they could really take away as a message from their life to from your life to make their life better? Well, um, I've already touched a bit on that before about how how they're incredibly you know tough and str- they're much stronger than they think they are. That they they've got it within them to take on the challenges of grappling with the world, right? So that, that certainly is one part of it. But um, it's funny when you say that because, you know, here, here we go again, typical Asian, you know, Asian tiger parent. Um, no, no, we're not. Um, uh, actually, funny thing is I'm probably the opposite of a tiger parent. I don't, I don't care much about the academics, although, that, again, you know, that's probably going to Going to land me in karmic hell with my um, with my family, but <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of you know sort of rote learning because I don't think it prepares them for life. 
Um, rather, I pretty much focused my efforts on getting him to learn the life lessons on a basketball court. So what do you learn on a basketball court? Well, there's a lot of things. Discipline, hard work, right? You get you get out what you put in. Um, you got to understand communication. You got to understand teamwork. You got to understand collaboration. So learning how to work with us, others, right? Um, and probably one of the most important lessons is how to you know, the resilience, how to deal with failure. Now you could do everything right. You could put in all the work and even, you know, even when you do all the things right, sometimes it just doesn't go your way. So what do you do? You pick yourself up and you keep going, you know, good game, come back stronger next time. It's incredible how much I've learned um, watching him and uh, coaching his his team and his friends um, through the, the lesson and probably one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life. You know, the relationship I have with not just him, but also uh, his teammates um, has, you know, almost, you know, just changed my, <laughs> again, changed how, how I see myself probably as part of my identity. Now I'm the coach, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm someone who I feel like I'm making a positive impact because what I'm teaching them is lessons about life more so than basketball. Yes, I'm teaching them how to win, but I'm also teaching them about having pride in the work that you put in, in how to handle failures, how to handle difficult times, right? And in fact, um, uh, probably one of the most important lessons I'm going to be parting with them <laughs> is is not to get cocky. So even when all the things are going right with you, you never ever disrespect your opponents. You know, it's about character. That is the most important thing in your life. Character is not reputation. It's not what other people think of you. Character is what all the millions of micro decisions you make every day. That is hard, right? Um, I'm reminded of this, you know, scene from Scent of a Woman, you know, where Al Pacino goes into a bad school, you know, and, and he talks about how Charlie's a better man than he was because he, at the crossroads in his life, I always knew what the right thing was. You know, very bad impression of Al Pacino. But I never took the path because it was too damn hard. Well, you know what it is? That's character. That's what character is. It's about choosing the right thing even when it's hard every single time. You know, making the right decision even when nobody is watching. That's what I want him to have. And if he can have that character, that's the most important thing he'll have in his life. Yeah, cool. So thank you. you. You've shared a hell of a lot in this. <laughs> I'm going to, what, what I do at the, you've listened to a few of the episodes, so you probably know. Uh, what I do at the end is I always provide a bit of a summary of the key points, which I've heard from you. I uh, give you the opportunity to correct or delete or adjust or add to anything which has been shared. And then off the back of that, um, you can also let people know how they can get in touch with you and what what they could possibly do if they wanted to learn more about your journey or connect with you and those types of things as well. So we, we started talking about success and you're saying it's evolved over time as opposed to your conditioning of how you were brought up thinking money, fortune, power, prestige, and the, the five C's and in Singaporean culture, that, that type of thing as well, right? Uh, yeah. It's now all about meaning a positive, uh, leaving a positive wake uh, or the positive wake that you leave behind you. Uh, finance can't be your sole purpose. It's important, but it can't be the only thing which you're looking at, right? Yep. And then we started looking at your upbringing. And so from Taiwan, you got to New Zealand and uh, when you, and there was military dictatorship at the time, not New Zealand, but Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> New Zealand, uh, when you're 10 years old, you couldn't even understand the language properly at that time. You learned a whole lot of different skills as you were going through and you realized the power of actually being able to listen. It made you a better listener, but also you wanted to be invisible. You didn't want to be the one who was getting yourself in trouble. You wanted to, you wanted to conform and disappear. And mm -hmm. you were told you were good at math and science, so don't bother with English and uh, don't bother with creativity. Go into actuarial studies. That's where you belong. And you just kind of wanted to minimize the pain. You didn't want to move outside your comfort zone, unlike what you're trying to teach to your sons, right? Uh, eventually, so you'd move to Australia for study and then you decided to give up on that and you uh, went into computer science, you discovered student politics as well and you um, you didn't actually see politics at uni as a career. Um, maybe it will be for your future, I don't know, I, I hear a lot of it, especially in the advocacy work, but um, <laughs> you, and you're saying that basically when you're not in charge of your own life, you tend to just go down the path of least resistance. And so, uh, you found yourself as an Asian Australian in modern Australian workplace. You kind of just couldn't make it. People were just getting promoted above you and you didn't really understand that it was your cultural programming 
that was telling you, be invisible. Don't uh, just do a good job and you're going to be recognized. Don't worry about telling other people you did a good job. That just makes you cocky. That devalues the good work that you've done. And what you've learned is that you actually need to be able to do a great job, but then also be able to tell other people that you've done a great job as well. And so then we started exploring this whole idea of uh, your tone diversity 2.0, like intellectual diversity. Make sure that you, if you're, uh, for anyone who's listening, to make sure that with their teams, they're, re they're representing all the perspectives that they actually, that their teams actually have, not just the representative, representative the representation of the ideas that already fit in with society. Don't just promote people based on how well they fit into the company. Promote them based on how much they're, their discomfort that they're going to bring and the difficulty that they're going to bring to the company is actually going to add to the profit, how much value that the messiness that hiring them is going to add to the profitability and to the betterment of the company as well as society, right? Yep. Um, and that might be the people, like you need to represent the ideas of the people who can't string a sentence together unless you just kind of give them time, right? Uh, and competence ultimately is what's most important as opposed to just giving people powerful positions when they're not actually competent or don't actually deserve to have it, right? Um, and so we're, ta we're talking about ultimately finding, finding the truth and then making it persuasive as well. Yeah, like you were, you were saying that sophistication is explaining complex topics. Um, it needs to be the best idea in the simplest way possible. You gave the Steve Jobs example of the, the button on the iPhone. Yeah. And that ultimately, like you were talking about changing yourself or changing your environment, it needs to be both. You need to take responsibility for yourself and you got to change your environment as well, right? Your values need to align with your organization. And if your organization is never going to align as you learn the hard way or the hard way is in, it took a long time to be able to discover it. Um, you started realizing that you need to make sure that you got the, that your values align, that you're in the right place that when you decide to become more persuasive and decide to push beyond your comfort zone, that's actually going to be more effective. And you gave the, I like the Nike example, right? You start out, <laughs> like you start out nice and authentic as a kid, basically purely authentic and naive. And then you get beaten down and conform. And you're only kind of, as you're maturing in life, you're only just finding more of your authentic self now. And you've described it as a journey, probably a journey that will never end, right? But mm -hmm. you share that most of your growth comes from being pushed over the edge and being pushed to the next kind of level. And to those people who are listening to this who are thinking, oh, then no, no, I can't push myself too hard. I can't push too far. Like I got to kind of just stay where I am. I, I shouldn't go too far beyond where I am right now. Um, those people are really going to benefit from learning the lesson of what you're sharing, that they need to push beyond their comfort zone. They need to go further. They need to create an impact in their life. Because if they're not create, like if they're not, if they're not pushing themselves to a point of being uncomfortable, then they're not going to be able to grow. They're not going to be able to be fulfilled. They're not going to be able to enjoy their life properly, right? Good things happen, as you shared, when you when you stood up for yourself, right? You had that client that just kept pushing you, pushing you. You're like, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. No, they keep pushing you. And then eventually you got to that point, and then they signed the next day. So when you did that three months earlier, right? And that must have been really uncomfortable for you to push. Like it would have gotten you, gotten you to a point where it was more uncomfortable to be polite than it was to really push back. And so you learn about your hierarchy of values and you're really misaligned with where you were at the time. You're, uh, you said that you're, um, you're Asian, but you're an Asian person. You're just finding your own place in the world, ultimately. And so you found that you're in a low point in your career. You're really frustrated. There are others who are really frustrated and really struggling as well. And so you, you basically ended up doing some type of values exercise as well as the 360 survey. And then you start getting to the point of go, okay, professional development survey, uh, like forum, we got to make sure that we're helping other people as well. And you found that if you were able to help other people, as opposed to promote self-promotion, if you're able to promote others, that you're able to create a lot of great change in your life, which is really cool. And then you were talking about what is fulfillment and you especially focused on having responsibility, mastery to be good at craft, and achievement in making a difference as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then you were talking about what you want to instill in your kids and it's ultimately just have have character, right? You're tough enough to face the world, to make the hard decisions, uh, to make the hard decisions that are going to teach you to do more things, to do more things that are going to help you make harder decisions further on. If you fall down, pick yourself back up, try again. It was a good game, do better next time. And ultimately that's what character is, right? The millions of decisions you make even when no one's watching. 
that's kind of what I've what I've learned from Jeffrey Wong in this last <laughs> hour and a half or so. That's very impressive. You've uh, <laughs> able to summarize all that. What what would what would you add to it, or what would you correct or adjust or or share in addition to? Oh, I think that's pretty comprehensive. I'm I'm actually blown away how much um, you comprehend. You're incredible listener. <laughs> <laughs> I did this podcast primarily as a, it pushed me out of my comfort zone to make sure that I listen more. That's probably the main reason for it. Uh, so I definitely align with much of what you've shared. Um, well, thank you. I mean, is there is there anything else which you'd want to share with the listeners? either about like a final message that you want to share or how people are able to find you as well. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I think that that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Look, I, I think if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, that's probably my public platform. Uh, so feel free to follow me for uh, professional development. Uh, I talk about professional development, cybersecurity, and a couple of other my pet topics, diversity 2.0, probably my, my three main uh, topics that I, I cover. Um, more than happy to reach out and have a chat. Look, if I can add value to your life, more than happy to. Um, yeah, so look forward to yeah hearing from you. Cool, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Oh, likewise. Thank you. So I hope you received a whole lot of value from engaging in that conversation. What were the key takeaways for you? What can you schedule in your life right now to make sure that the time you just invested into listening to this exceptional conversation with this amazing mentor and this amazing individual is time that wasn't misused, but was time that you've allocated properly to enhancing your life and improving it. Whatever it is, schedule it now, practice it now, be the successful person you're meant to be, live with purpose.